Now, make some noise. <laughs> About all I can do. Praise the Lord, everyone. Yeah, Amen. Lord. I, have re I have made sure that my phone is off. Mm -hmm. I pray that yours is off as well. This is part two from last week. We're still in the book of Philippians. Our introductory verses are coming out of chapter two. And I begin my reading at verse 12. As Paul writes to this church, and by the way, he writes to us as well. And these are some verses that we did get a chance to look at last week. And he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more, he says, in my absence. And listen, he's talking about us and them being consistent. He goes on. He says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And look, again, we spoke last week or mentioned last week that he's not talking about us saving ourselves, but God has indeed saved us. And if he has, there are some things that he would have you to do in regard to ministry. Everybody's not a, a pulpit minister, but we are all <coughs> ministers of Christ, and there's a work that he has called you to do. And he said, we need to go to the Lord and find out what that is, and then we need to be busy about the direction in which he has sent us to minister. Amen? Amen. He goes on in verse 13. In fact, verse 12. Again, I'm going to read it. He said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have not always obeyed, but not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, <laughs> work out your own salvation. In the end, verse 12, he said, With fear and trembling. And he's talking about reverential fear to the Lord, that we belong to him, we're working for him, we do what we do under the direction of him, and we need to recognize who him is, that he's the almighty God. Amen? Amen. In verse four, 13, he says, for, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do law of his good pleasure. And, and God says, much, uh, from the moment God called me, as much as I probably would have liked, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go ahead and preach where I want to go. No, no, it's, I'm, he blessed me with salvation and with the calling to preach. And it's for his pleasure. So I go where he wants me to go, not where I want to go. And I do what he would have me to do, not what I would want to do. Because if Brother Ralph had his choice, man, I'd be sitting over there eating like, like, like the rest of you because I don't want to be up front. But God said, no, I'm blessing you to be up front. Now do what I've called you to do. He says in verse 14, For do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be, he says, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. And in other words, without rebuke in God's eyes, because we're doing it his way, in the midst, look what he says, of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom, he says, ye shine as lights in the world, and guys, I pray that's true of me, and I pray that's true of you as well, that when he sets you in the midst of this perverse nation of folk who don't know God, that there should be something about you that shines and sets itself apart from the rest of the world because God has blessed you, he's called you, he's ministered to you, and you have his spirit, and something in you ought to shine and look better than the things of this world. And in verse 16, he says, holding forth the word of life. And I love that because God's word is the word of life. It's the word that gives life when properly applied and as his Holy Spirit directs. He said that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And listen, I love that. He, he, he tells us in Romans 12 and 1 that we're to present our bodies a, a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And he said that that's what? Our reasonable service. service. That that ought to be the least that we do. And, and, and guys, look, in the world, folk want to do the least they can do, but we ought to do, want to do the best and the most that we can do because we're working for our Lord and he says in verse 17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And listen, what he's saying is that, look, if I'm jailed, 
if I'm martyred and killed for my faith, for my service to you, Paul is saying, that's okay with me. Because I got killed or I got jailed for doing what God has called me to do. And I'm okay with that. As his son was okay for dying in my stead. I'm okay with that. Because I did it to the glory of God. I ask you to be prayerful with me as I preach the same sermon title, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this would be part two. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you will hide me behind your cross. And Father God, have the words that you have had me to study for this week be for this congregation. And Lord, I heard the prayer request. I, I, I saw some of the faces that they were giving the request. And, and Lord, I even saw the praise report. And Father, I know we're all going through something. And there were even some unspoken. And, and I pray in the name of Jesus that this truth that you'll have me to share today is for us. And that you will allow by your Holy Spirit that he will place it in our hearts and in our lives where it will do the most good. There are some that are struggling in their walk, Father God. Allow this word to help them in their walk. There are some that are struggling in their marriage or in their life or, or, or Lord, somewhere in their ministry, Lord, that, that you allow this word to give them enlightenment and to bless them in the name of Jesus Christ, to whom we pray with much, much thanksgiving. As we say collectively, amen. 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 And amen. <laughs> I went to the doctor, um, had a physical, and they would give me all these tests. One of them was the cognitive test, and, and they, had, they gave me all this information. Then they went on to, to have me fill out all these forms and do other things. And then they came back and said, okay, Mr. Williams, what is it that I told you that I wanted you to remember? And it was a gentleman's name, his address, how old he was, what he did for a living and all these other things. And, and I, I looked at, at, at the nurse and I said, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> and, and, and I said, because I couldn't remember this even when I was 20. <laughs> but, but guess what? I called on the Lord and he gave everything back with the exception of the last name of this man. He gave it back to me. And, and, and the young man, he probably was about 25, he said, man, I couldn't have answered all that. I, but, and so I had a chance to tell him, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. And I love that. And, and, and listen, we, when we go to chapter 3, verse 1, which is where we'll be starting today, he says, finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. Indeed, it's not grievous for me. He said, but for you were saved. And Paul is saying, look, if I got to tell you the same thing over and over, look, I'm the same way as a preacher. If I got to keep preaching the same thing or, or, or sharing or giving an understanding of the same verse over and over, I'm okay. It doesn't bother me. And Paul said, but for you were saved, it, once you get it, he goes on in verse 2, he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And listen, it's almost like a word play or, or, or a play on words when he said beware of dogs because the Jews at one time they would call the Gentiles dogs. So he says beware of dogs, beware of, of, of evil workers, beware of the concision. And, and he's pointing toward those, those law keepers. He's pointing toward the, the Judaizers who were trying to take the Gentile church back to a work system. And Paul is saying beware. And by the way, he's speaking to us as well in our time. He says in verse 3, for we, and it's talking about Christians here, are the circumcision, and, and I love that word, man, and, and listen, normally it's talking about the, the cutting away of the flesh, but he's talking about here, the cutting away of the flesh or the sinful part of our heart. He says, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit and work and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And he says, and have no confidence in the flesh. And as I read this, I'm thinking about the cognitive test that the nurse gave me. And for a second, man, in my flesh, I could not have come up with what he told me to come up with. But in Christ, man, I was able to come up and rattle off the answers that he was looking for. And listen, that, that, that goes for us as we get older. Look, a lot of things I used to be able to do. 
Man, there was some, some, some big weight that I used to get over that bar and pick that bad boy up and, and curl it a, a 50 times if I wanted to. But I picked that bar up now, barely. And, and I start curling, and in my mind, I sat. And, and I say, well, I'm going to do this 25 times. And, and it gets to about 10, and I'm like, Lord, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> because I, what happened is my flesh wrote a check that my body will not cash. And, and so, no, I can't have confidence in my flesh anymore. So, so, and, and I love that as we get older, God has us to rely more and more and more on him. Amen. And, and the reality, that's how he wants it. Anyhow, Amen. he says in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh, he said, that, that he have whereof, he says he might trust in the flesh. Paul says, I more. He says in the King James, and look, what he's saying is that if there was anyone who could get this thing right in life, doing it through the means of the flesh, I probably would have been the one. And he begins to run down his pedigree in verse 5. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. And he's letting us know he was a purebred. It says of the tribe of Benjamin. And, and that was one of the elite tribes. He says in Hebrew of Hebrew. In other words, I, I, I descend from Hebrews. My father was one. His grandma, his father was one. He says as touching the law, he doesn't even give an answer here. He simply says a Pharisee. And listen, for the time they were known for not only knowing the law completely, but keeping it. But that was only in their own minds. Because in reality, nobody could keep the law. Only Christ could and did. Amen. But they could not. But in their own minds, they thought they were. And, and listen, before I go any further, I, I, I'm reminded of another Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. In chapter 3 of John, he, he went to, to meet with Jesus. And, and he wanted to meet him all by himself. So he went at night. So he could have a private audience. And, and that Pharisee, Nicodemus, thought that he was going to go to Jesus. And he was going to command the conversation and maybe get some information. And he began to butter Jesus up a little bit. We know you are, you are a man from God. so Because nobody can do these things lest God be with him. And, and look, Jesus knows all things. Knows us too. And knew he was coming there that night. And in the middle of his soliloquy, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Blew up my man's whole program. Didn't know what to say after that. And then from there, God took him, God, Jesus took him through some verses, through some series of conversations to help him to know even about the Holy Spirit. And listen, was asking questions. He said, wait a minute, you're supposed to be a master of the law and you don't know these things? And again, Pharisees, very arrogant, very self-centered, and thought they knew the law. And Paul talks about himself here as a Pharisee. And he says that he was of the Hebrews of Hebrews as touching a law. He says a Pharisee. He goes on, still part of his pedigree, concerning zeal. Look what he says. Persecuting the church. And listen, Paul was doing that. He was doing it with everything that he had. And, and, and this is the kicker. As a Pharisee, he thought he was doing the will of God. That's right. Thought he was going to get some brownie points for that. Didn't know. Even above everybody else in his family, he would do it even the more. He would jail them. He would chain them. And they would take them away and put them in prison on the word of Paul. Because they were preaching in that, hallelujah, miraculous name. Jesus Christ, he says, concerning zeal, verse 6, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, he says, which is of the law. Paul says, blameless. In his mind, he thought he was blameless. And in his ignorance, he thought he was blameless. In verse 7, Paul says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost, he said, for Christ. And look what he's saying, that my earthly accolade, man, I, I, I was a man among men. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Folk would see me coming and they would give me respect. Anywhere I went, folk would look at me and look at me like I was a king. 
because I was a Pharisee. And I had all the worldly accolades that a man could have. And it seemed like I could do no wrong. And that was true of him. <clears throat> and guys, it's true of a whole lot of folk who quote unquote think they're self-made men. And I got all the money I need, and I got the best job, I, I, I got the best education, and, and, and listen, I got, not only do I have a doctorate, I, I got also a double master's, and, and, and all this is gone, and folk are grabbing for me, other CEOs want me to come work for them, because I am the man, and that's what Paul thought he was, the man. And to the world, he was the man, until he reached or met the God man, Christ Amen. Jesus. He says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, he says, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the, of the knowledge of, of Christ Jesus. In other words, and guys, we need to know that he's better than all things. He said, Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. And he's talking about waste, man, the thing that come up out of us after we put stuff in us. He says he counts them but dung that I may win Christ. Man, it was that valuable to him. Man, this man was bred to be a Pharisee. He was bred to, to persecute Christians. And once Christ came on the scene and blinded him and then opened his eyes, he saw him with brand new heart and he realized that he had been wrong all that time. And he realized his parents were wrong and his friends were wrong. And it said that he lost all things. In other words, man, they looked at Paul as the enemy. Because in reality, he really was. Family, friends, didn't want to have anything to do with Paul anymore. And, and guys, I dare say, you might not have a story that's as, as, as powerful as Paul's, but your coming to faith in Christ has caused you something as well. But we need to look on those things as dumb for the excellency that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says in verse 9, And be found in him, look, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, and he's talking about works, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, he said, by faith. And what he's talking about, man, all along, I'm trying to work this thing. I'm trying to look good for God. I want to get brownie points for God. I'm persecuting Christians. And along comes Jesus Christ and tells me that I'm persecuting him. And he blinded my eyes and hallelujah, I realized that he was Lord. And the same zeal Paul had toward persecuting Christians, when God straightened him out, and bless his understanding and his heart, he had that same zeal for making sure that Christ is known wherever he goes. So much so that he was imprisoned many times, incarcerated for the preaching of the word, and even ultimately was martyred for his faith. Because guys, I gotta tell you, when you meet Jesus, I mean really meet him, Man, you can't stay the same. And listen, old things are passed away. The whole, all things are brand new. I can't go back. And sometimes a mind wants to take me back. But man, the spirit that lives inside of me says, no, Brother Ralph, we don't go or do that anymore. He says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of love his resurrection, and the fellowship, he even says, of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. In other words, listen, to have an intimate knowing of Jesus Christ. And look, he takes us all kinds of different and various ways and allows different and various things in your life to make you more and more less self-sufficient and that we can get closer to God so that we can be Jesus-sufficient. And know, hallelujah, that whatever I need in life can be found in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.
He says in verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He said that, look, God has made him worthy to rise when he dies. Not as though he says, I have already attained. Either were already perfect. He goes on, but I follow after. He said, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of. He says, Christ Jesus. And, and listen, what he's talking about is, is, is getting what God has reserved for him. Man, prior to Christ, we were in bondage. But Christ has set us free. And once we come to the place, or once he brings us to the place that, that, that we realize that he has set us free, that it, it was his finished works, and, and, and listen, not our own works, that, that now I, I want more of the one that has captured my heart, the one that has set me free. I want more of him and less of me. And every time my flesh tries to raise up, I grab hold of more Jesus because I know I couldn't do it in my flesh. But man, in Christ Jesus, Fine, I can do all things that he would have me to do. And I find that my life is even that much more blessed. Not, verse 12, as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after that, if that I may apprehend that for which also, he says, I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He goes on in verse 13, brethren. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, thank you, Lord, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. In other words, man, there were some rough times back there. And listen, sometimes my mind tried to tell me that it was good times back there, but what I know is I can't go back there because God has something for me and his front way is forward and that's what I want. That's what I want. Because I already know if I go back to that mess, I'm simply going to put my, I might as well go to the jail house and they say, Brother Ralph, what you want? Put me in prison. Yeah. And just yeah. let them lock me up and throw away the key. But I can't go back there. I go forward for the land and the blessings and the ministry that God has prepared for me. He says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Now think about what you do throughout the day. Especially we who are retired and don't work. What do you do with your day? You, you, you watch TV? Maybe watch some sports? Look at the internet? Do different various things? And, and, and God says that we need to be trying to figure out what it is he'll have us to do with that day. And, and guys, I got to tell you, outside of getting, in, getting with him in prayer, or getting in his word, you're never going to find out what he has in store for you if you're always busy about everything under the sun and you forget to grab a hold and get close <coughs> to the sun. Because he's got something for you. And, and listen, I don't, know, I don't know exactly what it is for you, but, but every day he shows me more and more. And, and listen, I, I don't say, okay, Lord, I see it. I leave me alone. I'm going to go do it. No, I say, Lord, okay, I see what you're saying. Now you've got to show me how I'm going to do it, empower me to do it, and even give me the boldness to open my mouth and do and say what you would have me to do. Because I want to be about your business. And especially, guys, in the time that we are living and we see it getting rougher and rougher and rougher in this world. And there are some folk out there that need to know about the hope you have. But they'll never know if you're not obedient to God when he touches your heart and you don't open your mouth and tell them about one Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen. Paul thought he had it all together as a Pharisee. But once he met Jesus Christ, his life could never be the same again. 
All through the Gospels, we see folk that have met Jesus and, and some want to kill him, some want to cast him aside, some want to say, get out of here, some want to say, get on the cross. But occasionally, it was one that couldn't see and they would meet Jesus and he would do something abstract and, and, and next thing you know, they're seeing and their lives were never the same, not only physically, but spiritually. There were some that couldn't walk. And Jesus would come along, or, or his apostles would come along, and, and listen, they would bless and, and be healed, and, and they would leap up and, and, and jump, in, and, and listen, their lives were never the same. And for we who know the Lord, guys, look, from the moment I met him, even though I still had a lot of mess with me, my life was never the same. I couldn't go do what I used to do in peace. Couldn't sin in peace. And God had a higher calling on me. And by the way, he got a higher calling on you. And Paul knew he had a higher calling on him. He says in verse 14, I press and I pray this is true of us toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. And it is a high calling. There's no higher in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many be perfect. And listen, he's not talking about sinless perfection, but he is talking about maturing moment by moment and day by day. He goes on, be thus minded. And if anything, or if in anything, ye be otherwise minded, he says, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, when you fall short, the Lord's going to let you know. He might send somebody your way. Might tell you, have your wife tell you. Might just... Read something in the Word and it impresses on your heart <coughs> that the direction that you're going is not the direction that God would have you to go. I love my wife because as God is no respecter of persons, my wife ain't either. <laughs> and, and, and I mean that in a good way. And one Sunday I had preached a sermon and she thought she heard me say something that, that I really didn't say. And so when we came home and she wasn't talking, I said, what's wrong with you? And she said, I, I got to ask you something about your sermon. And she thought I said something that I didn't. I said, well, no, I didn't really say that. She said, no, I heard you. I heard you. And as you know, we videotape our services. So I played it back and I got to that place. I said, well, just listen. And so it went through and she said, and I for sure thought I heard you say something. I said, look, I, I thank God that you called me on it. I thank God that you think enough of me that if you thought I did something wrong and I needed to know, and look, if I did, I did, did need to know. Amen. And listen, though, though she didn't hear what she thought she heard, we still praise God together because she's a woman who don't care whether it's me or somebody else. If they're doing wrong, she's going to call me on it. I love that. Amen. Don't always like it. <laughs> but I love that. And listen, Paul had the same attitude. Man, he didn't mess around. He didn't care what Peter or, or, or Barnabas or who it was. If he saw you wrong, he caught you on it. And guys, as brothers in Christ, we ought to call each other on different and various things that we see in ourselves. If we know that somebody's struggling or having a problem in an area, simply ask them or start praying for them. There was one day it was here, and it was a brother here, and he's not here, hadn't been here in quite some time. And, and I could just look on his face, man, and I could just see that he was struggling big time. I had no idea what it was. So after the service, I, I asked him to step outside, not to fight him. <laughs> but the step outside, and I said, I said, man, what's, what's going on with you? And he tried to muster up a smile. He said, oh, brother, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I'm always okay. And I wouldn't let it go. I said, no, what's going on with you? And he said it again. I oh, everything's all right. I'm all right. And so I asked him one more time. I said, what's wrong with you? And literally, he broke down and started crying. And, and just started sharing some things that were going on in his life. And right there and there, we were able to hug him, man. We prayed, and, and, and prayerfully, the prayer helped. I don't know if he's still there. I see him from time to time. But, but the Lord showed me that of him, 
And, and guys, I wasn't going to let it go until he got to that place. And if he didn't, that's okay. I would just pray for him later on as well. Because I know something. And, and, and listen, that's part of, of the giftedness that God has given to me. He not, not only called me as a pastor and a teacher, he's also called me as a mercy shower. And, and, and when somebody's going through, sometimes when I get close to them and start talking, I can sense it. And God gave me that. And guys, there are some folk in here right now, or some folk that you know that are going through some things. And, and look, it might be family. You don't want to open your mouth. You don't want to say nothing. Say something. Because you might be their line of hope. You never know. But if you bury your head in the sand, as many will bury their heads in the sand, it can go for a long time and they can be hurting and hurting and hurting some more. And, and by the way, if you're going through something and you're hurting, grab hold of somebody. And let them know that you need prayer. You don't have to get into specifics. Just let them know you need prayer. <clears throat> that you're hurting. And that you're fighting a battle and this battle is not going your way. Let them know. Amen? Amen. And by the way, that wasn't even part of the sermon. I gave it to you for free. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. He, said, he says in verse 14, as I close out here, he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many be perfect, be thus minded, and if any, and if and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, he said, let us walk, look what he says, by the same rule, let us mind the same things. And, and listen, let's be in the mind of Christ. Verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so ye have us for an example. And, and listen, that's on the good or the bad. Look, you get false teachers, you hear them on the TV, you know they ain't right, pass the word. Amen? Amen. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, it broke Paul's heart, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And it breaks his heart and surely breaks God's heart as well. In verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction, look, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind, look what he says, earthly things. And he's talking about these guys who simply are praising themselves. And their God is their belly, whatever they can get, whatever they can put their hands on. For so some is money, for some is lust, for some is different and various things. And he's saying that God of heaven is not their God. They're their own God. Or they're worshiping the God of this world who is Satan. And verse 20 he says, For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also, he says, We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change. Look what he says. Our vile bodies. And he's talking about our earthly bodies. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the works whereby, look, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And, and listen, he's helping us to understand that when we leave here, we'll get a body that's fashioned like Jesus. But while we're here, we are in these earthly bodies, and they still have a sin nature. And sometimes we lean toward that sin nature. <laughs> but he's reminding us that God's spirit lives inside of us, and if we call on him, that he will always help in the time of trouble. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this sermon session that you've allowed this day. And Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the words that you blessed me to be able to speak, to understand, and even to be able to share. Father God, if there's anyone here that's going through and they're not talking about it and holding it close to their best, Father, I pray, Father God, not so much that they reveal it to me, but, Lord, that they will come to you in earnest prayer. And, Father God, leave that on your altar. And, and for that one that, that, that's struggling, Father, I pray a prayer for them. And, and I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that whatever it may be, that by your spirit you touch them, you bless them. And, Father God, help them to know that you already love them and have shown them by your, your, your place on that cross. And, Father God, that you will continue to love them. Lord, even though the world might tell them they're unlovely, 
that you love them still the most. We thank you. We praise you. Please look in on our prayer list and bless as you see fit as we pray in Jesus' name and for his namesake. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you. Amen.